come. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, somebody shout suddenly. suddenly. There came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were seated. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongue as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you will, bow your heads in prayer with me now. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to come on this sacred desk to exchange, oh God, what it is that you have given to us. Father, we pray, oh God, for our pastor, our overseer, even now as he travels, oh God, Apostle Eugene Shepherd, oh God, we pray, oh God, his strength. Lord, we pray for the local assembly, O oh God, that they will hear and take heed to the call of God on their lives. Now, Father, let these words, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, may they be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. Turn to your neighbor and say, fresh wind and fresh fire. Fresh wind and fresh fire. We're dropping away and moving away from the series that we have been teaching as the Lord prepares me for another series. And in this inter moment and in this time, the Lord is dealing with me on a number of different things. And I'm putting my ears to his breast to hear exactly what it is that I should be saying to his people. And the Lord just reminded me today about... This period in time, 50 days after the resurrection. And from a Pentecostal standpoint, we have approached this day to mean a denominational expression where everyone opts to wear white. This is as close to white as I could get. But nonetheless, the white is not the purpose of the season. It's the crimson blood of Christ that will stain that white outer garment and cleanse the inner garment who we are. Without the cleansing, there is no revelation, there's no expression of what it means to have entered into this so-called Pentecost. I will explain and express my thoughts momentarily. But I want you to understand that we are maturing in the word of God. And in maturing in the word of God, it's now not a day, but it's a season. And in that it's a season, we must operate in a season, an epoch, a period in time. And when we operate in a period in time, we will see the manifestation of all the things that God has in store. We bless God for the going home celebration of our dear departed Deacon George Washington Brown on yesterday. But what I would venture to say most of us would have missed is the spiritual transactions that took place at the culmination of his life. Because he was a man that stood for high integrity, he stood for character, he stood for all of the things that the Bible would look for in a natural man. But more importantly than the natural man is the spirit of the man and the spirit that is housed and was housed in the, ve in the vessel. And he left and will leave a legacy here. But from my vantage point, the legacy that he leaves is tied to the work that he contributed to here on the earth. And I cannot tell you how many different individuals came up to me on yesterday and says, we will support the legacy of the vision that has been crafted. Oh, that's a good place for you to get excited. Because these people are not directly connected to this house, but because of the life of one man, they said, I'm going to continue supporting the work that is here. I had a lady approach me. She sent me an email on Friday evening <clears throat> asking for some documents. 
And she said, she walked up to me, and this is someone I met before. And she was completely transformed on the exterior. She says, do you know who I am? I looked at her. I said, your face looked familiar, but please help me. When she told me, I, I had to take a step back because it was not the person. Y'all, Ladies, now y'all know how to change yourself so much that the brother can't even. He, <clears throat> we will leave that alone. But nonetheless, she says, I am connected through Brother George, through Sister Evie, to the work that Lydia's house does. And now I'm connected to the ministry. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that you I release a whole lot of money in your direction. I'm not, concur I'm not so concerned about the money. I'm concerned about the connection. Because God is transacting business in the kingdom of God. Saints of God, <clears throat> when you connect yourself to what God is doing in this season, you become a conduit by which he's going to bless the house. You've got to embrace the truth of what God is doing here. Because God is setting you on a journey. And in that he has set you on a journey, you will be able to declare that God has gone ahead of me and he has made every crooked pathway straight. That's why I can get up every morning and be excited about because I know that the encounter that I'm going to have is divine. It's divinely connected to the things that God has in store. How many of you know that when you wake up every day, you ought to be looking for God on display? As a matter of fact, you ought to be God on display. Why? Because he lives on the inside of us. The day of Pentecost was a day that changed the life of the church that we know today. The Holy Spirit had proverbially come. It's so interesting that we mark this day as the day of the coming of the Holy Spirit when he had already been there. I'll leave that for another day. The church now had the power to exhibit the life and miracles of Jesus to the rest of the world. But why did God send the wind and the fire? You see the wind and the fire is expressed in that second chapter of the book of Acts. In the first chapter of the book of Acts. And as we see in the book of Acts, there was something fresh in the air. Somebody shout fresh. fresh. Like a spring morning, there was a fresh scent. There was a fresh atmosphere. You become the representation of the freshness of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God is dwelling in you each and every day. Each new day. The freshness of the worship embodied something that could not be canned. It could not be found on the shelf. You go to the grocery store. Sometimes if you notice the grocery store is designed in a certain way. The outer aisles, if you look at it, are all contained with the fresh products. The inner aisles are all processed. Think about it. Processed. So you as a fresh anointing, you've got to be able to enter in and occupy the outer. There was nothing canned about the embodiment of the freshness of the spirit that was coming about on that day. Because you can't contain freshness. It's alive. The Holy Spirit is alive. And you are alive. And if you have the Holy Spirit in you, then you too are alive. This is what we're now calling organic. This term has evolved in the last 20 years. The Holy Spirit, if we were to say so, he is organic. He's fresh. He's authentic. It is like what we are seeing in the Christian um, today as it relates to this present apostolic season that we always refer to. And we want to drilling this, we want to drill this thing home because the apostolic, the authentic word of God cannot find itself wrapped up into the old Pentecostal paradigm. It must change. If you package the old into the new, then the old is the new and then the new becomes non-existent. God wants to say, as a matter of fact, the word of God says you cannot put new wine into old wine skin. So this freshness must now take on a new life. And I want to have that new life in us. 
or so the new life must exist in me. There's something fresh happening and it becomes necessary for you and me to identify with this fresh anointing so that we can be in step with the Holy Spirit. You know, in my daughter's recent graduation, I shared with you in the past the story of the mother that went to see their children, their child graduate from the military academy, right? Y'all remember that? Somebody do. Thank you. And the formation, the military formation was marching. And everyone was in step except for that parent's child. So when they took one step, his head went down, everybody else's head went up. When they took another step, everybody's head went down and his went up. And the mother turned and said to somebody and says, why is everybody out of step? My child is the only one in step. Now, for all these years, I used to laugh at that story until I went to see my daughter graduate a couple of weeks ago. No, they weren't marching. But the truth of the matter is, I didn't see anybody else in all the hundreds of people that were graduating. It was She was the only one. So now I can finally identify to everybody else being out of step but my child. Fresh. We've got to have a different perspective. We've got to look at things differently. No longer can we afford to say, well, this is how we did it last year. God is doing something new in the midst of his people. The ones who are in tune to the spirit of God. Bible says when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. The wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. We used to attribute that the Holy Spirit was the tongue speaking. The Holy Spirit is not the tongue speaking. It's a manifestation is what the tongue is. The Holy Spirit came and dwelt on the inside of them. And if it was not dwelling on the inside of them, they could not speak in tongues. That's why we have a misnomer and a misunderstanding of what tongues mean. God is shifting my belief system and he's waking me up and he's causing me to see that the tongues are very important. My bishop used to say, you cannot get the whole, you can't go to the store, buy a pair of shoes and the tongues don't come with it. It just does. And in that it comes with it, amen, the Holy Spirit, when he comes upon you and he takes his abode inside of your heart, he, he will enable you to speak in other tongues. As the Spirit gives the utterance. We will do a teaching on the Holy Spirit in some other time, but this morning it's not so. There are certain days that we can all look back on that represent a day of significance. Days that change us for the rest of our lives. Might have been when you got married. In my case, it might have been my graduation, my children's graduation, a certain significance. We all remember those days. The same can be said about our nation. On the 4th of July, we celebrate independence, do we not? We celebrate independence. Then we have tragedy occurring on September 11th and so on and so forth. Different days of great significance that are memorable. The day of Pentecost becomes memorable for those of us that have that experience with the Holy Spirit. Then that's what occurred. The book of Acts chapter 2, it was a day when everything changed for the followers of Christ. Everything changed. Do you remember the day that you gave your life to the Lord? Some of us do, some of us don't. But for me, it was a life transforming day. 
an experience that I have not ever forgotten. And somehow I continue to live that day over and over and over again as a day of celebration. Why? Because I want to continue walking in this newness of light. You know, something that is so awesomely important. We celebrate the 4th of July as a day of significance for the nation. But in the case of my wife, the 4th of July has dual meaning, the day of uh, the, uh, the independence, but it's also her birthday. So now I cannot go in, which I've done in the past, forgive me, Lord. I took her downtown one day and I, I said, here, I've thrown all of this big party. This 500,000 people are here invited to your party. She decided to marry me. Lord, help us all. But Pentecost is like a day like no other. But Pentecost was not just a singular day. Pentecost meaning 50. I'm going to get there. I'm trying to run not too fast ahead of myself. Was Pentecost was the annual Jewish holiday that came 50 days after the Passover. It commemorated the day when Moses met God on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, which was believed to be 50 days after Israel left Egypt. Now you see now this day of Pentecost, the celebration, the feast of the Passover, has some different significance here. So now we've got to understand what was occurring while these people came together. It was also commemorated the ingathering of the harvest. Now, we see that it was very important that we have the facts about the celebration because growing up, the inference was that Pentecost only represented the outpouring of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Is that what it came, some of us came to know it as being? Be honest. They didn't teach us about the festival. And what was taking place and what was taking place was important. Now, the significance of Pentecost and the outpouring of the presence of God is important. You must believe and understand why God does things when he does them and how he does them so that we do not miss the significance of where it is that he is taking us to. Because God has laid down time and seasons. And in that he's laid out times and seasons, those of us that are prophetically inclined and want to hear the prophetic utterances of the word of God, we must now learn like the Bereans do and study the scriptures daily. Because in studying the scriptures daily, we will understand synchronized, synchroni oh, that word right there, synchronized, how God intends to do things. Yes, so we must now understand that the feast is one thing, but the presence of God and his outpouring has a great meaning to those of us who follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. For what is it worth? Pentecost, the day of Pentecost is the church's birthday. Okay, so yes, embrace it, but know what it means. It's a celebration. God laid down his law. And in that he laid down his law and he, we have moved us from the literal law into the grace of God. We must see how God is moving. He is now transitioning us and moving us into a new dimension. So Pentecost, while it's important, the apostolic anointing that has been released in the season that we're in is equally important. And we must now move into that prophetic utterance. Also moving in manifestations, manifestations of seeing the presence of God. No longer is it okay to just come in and sit and soak up and draw from. We must now, like I said earlier, push forth and release the presence of God that's in your life so that God can use you, 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 and you to bring a word to the house. Manifestation sounds like the blowing of a violent wind, even the sight of tongues of fire, prophetic utterances, declaring the wonders of God in our own language is what the word of God says. And this was foretold 
by the prophet Joel. Let's look at Joel chapter 2 real quickly and hear how Joel lays this out for us. He says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Is that the word of God or is that the word of God? That is the word of God. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. That's the word of God. So if God says that this is coming, then guess what? It is coming. As a matter of fact, the time is here and it is here right now. The outpouring of the presence of God is necessary for every child of God. Verse 29 says, and also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Saints of God, we saw the Aurora Borealis just this past week occurring all the way here in the US of A, or this portion of the US of A. We've never seen anything like that before. Ordinarily, it's the northern lights, but now the northern lights are coming south. The signs of the times are here, and we that are prophetic and prophetically inclined must now know without a shadow of a doubt that the soon return of the Lord is imminent. He is right around the corner. The time for us to live our lives and prove to everyone around us that we, we stand for the word of God is now. We must stand on and for the word of God. Verse number 30 says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great day and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. This remnant, the remnant of Christ, that represents the Latter-day Saints that are here even now. And what do I mean by Latter-day Saints? I'm not talking about that denomination. I'm talking about you and me today. The ones of those of us that remain and can hear prophetically what God is doing and be positioned to operate in the spirit and the realm of the spirit continually. God is going to do great things. Say that with me, please. God will do great things through my life. You got to get this in your spirit sense. I'm not trying to get something from you. I'm trying to get something to you because God is telling me that this body of believers, this small body of believers will do great and mighty exploits. That is the reason why the connections are being made the way they are. And the connection cannot come from the head only. We are fitly and jointly joined together. If the pastor is the only one that God is using, then something is wrong with that picture. If the pastor is the only one getting blessed, something is wrong with that picture. If the pastor is the only one driving a Mercedes, I'm not even going to say Cadillac anymore, a Mercedes, then you know what? There's something wrong with that picture. If the pastor is the only one living in a big house, there's something very wrong with that picture. God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I don't know about you. All means all. So my expectation for the sons of God is to rise up and do what they, see, what they see their father do. If your father is connected, then you get connected. Oh, saints of God, I'm excited about what God is doing in our midst here today. And it shall come to pass again that whoever calls, are you or whoever I don't know about anybody else. I fit into that category of whoever. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance. In Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance. I don't know about anybody else. That Mount Zion and Jerusalem means Jerusalem means the uttermost part of the earth. Everybody is included in this. The kingdom of God is coming and has come to the earth. As the Lord has said among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Early in the second chapter of the book of Joel, 
The first verse, it says, blow the trumpet in Zion. And sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the Lord, of, for the day of the Lord is coming. For it is at hand. We no longer have to say that the day of the Lord is coming, saints of God. I want to remind you and let you know that God said that the day of the Lord is now. You don't have to wait till tomorrow to be blessed or be a blessing. You can do just that today because God has poured out his spirit upon all flesh. You see, what's happening is that the Pentecost also means the prophetic outpouring of the presence of the power of God. Yes, we can no longer be getting ready. We must be ready. We can no longer afford to be getting ready. We must be ready. Turn to your neighbors and let them know I'm ready. But you better not lie in church. Are you really, really ready for what God is doing? Truth be told, there's, if you are divinely connected to this house and the house is connected to the other households, we will see the manifestation of this very word that I'm preaching here today. I believe that we have entered into the season of the pouring out of the presence of God once again. He has never stopped pouring out his presence. God has never stopped pouring out. The vessels have been contaminated for that reason. They have not been able to receive. Therein lies why we cannot put new wine into old wineskin. He's looking for a new wineskin to pour himself in. The vessel that you are must be washed, must be cleaned up. You can't do it physically. It's not a physical cleaning. It's a spiritual catharsis. And we must move from a place where we are and so that God can pour himself into us. And the only way that he will pour himself into us is that we come to him with a broken spirit, ready, willing, and say, Lord, you put me back together again. I am going to put away those old teachings. I'm going to put away those old things and I'm going to come to you fresh and I'm going to get into your word and I'm going to see you the way I need to see you. The returning of the hearts of the fathers to the son. Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. My God, we're still talking about Pentecost here, saints of God. This outpouring says, behold, I will send Elijah. The spirit of Elijah is here right now. The Holy Spirit. When Jesus went back to be with his father, he says, I am going to leave you a comforter. And in leaving you a comforter, that comforter is called the Holy Spirit. And the only place that he's going to operate is in us. The hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. <clears throat> when Zacharias was an old man, the angel Gabriel came to him with glad tidings, is what the word of the Lord says. That glad tidings represents the Holy Spirit. And this is how I want to come today with good news. I bring you through the vessel, the Holy Spirit. The angel told Zacharias, he said, you're going to have a son. The son here, not Christ, but the son here represents a prophetic utterance, a word. And if I come to you and says you're going to have a son, that means I'm telling you that you're going to have a word. Whatever it is that you're going to give birth to, it's going to produce life, life for the kingdom of God. Zachariah says, you know, Mr. Angel, sir, do you realize how old I am? See, what happens when we do not translate our minds from the natural to the spiritual, we miss and we could miss what God is doing. 
for just that quick instance, Zacharias saw the natural son. And he looked at his physical body and says, I cannot do it. But the angel says, I didn't come to you with an option. This is called by God. This is divinely orchestrated by God. And because it's divinely orchestrated by God, you don't have a choice in this matter. I know sometimes we preach about you have a choice. My prayer always, Lord, I'm not smart enough. Limit my choices down to one. That is my prayer. I mean that sincerely. That's not a cliche. Because sometimes I find myself in situations where I might have to choose. And I said, Lord, I don't want to make the wrong choice. So I need you to limit my choices down to one. And that choice is always God. And when I choose God, I cannot go wrong. Saints of God, my life has been dictated to me in such a way that I choose God every single time. Zachariah says, I've been alive for a very long time. I can't do the things that I used to do. My body can't stand up like it used to stand up. You see, one of the things that we have to embrace is this move, in this move of the Holy Spirit is the fact that you and me are not in control. You know, we sing the song, I give myself away so that you can use me. Lord, I turn it all over to you. And words of that sort. But when it comes time for the rubber to meet the road, do we really and truly turn it all over to him? Turn to your neighbor and say, God is in control of my life. And because God is in control, all he needs is our cooperation. Cooperation for some is a dirty word. I want what I want, how I want, when I want, and the way I want it. I can see some of us going to God, telling God what you want. And he sits there and he laughs in our faces. Show you right. How about you just come humble, broken, and say, Lord, I surrender. Do you understand what it means to surrender? That means you give up all. And Lord, I've, as I've given up all, I am now empty. I'm ready to receive all of you. And I want this fresh wind. I want this fresh fire. I want this Holy Spirit to take full control of my life. The angel says to Zacharias, Luke chapter 1, verse 13. Do not be afraid. For your prayer is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness. Somebody shout joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Isn't that what God told Abraham? I will make your name great. Oh, we need to embrace that. Let God do it and watch and see how good and how great you become. Because he recognizes that you are not trying to get the attention for yourself. The vessels that God will use in this season, this season are the ones that don't want the accolades, don't want to be on the front page. The ones that say, you know what? I can work behind the scenes. You don't even have to recognize me. Because I know in whom I believe. I heard the voice of God. In my younger days in coming up, I would serve recklessly. Just recklessly. Because it didn't matter if somebody saw me. Behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, it, Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, it didn't matter. When everybody else was sleeping, I was in the, the media booth splicing tapes together, having to take them to the radio station. 
Why? Because the gospel was being preached. I wasn't the one preaching it. No, I wasn't preaching. The man of God was preaching, but I needed to do my job so that thousands could hear the word of God. And you mean to tell me that God is not going to reward me? Oh, saints of God, whatever you do in obscurity, God will illuminate when the time is right. Verse 15 says, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and will drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, their God. My friends, this becomes the most important ingredient in this whole equation. Being used by God to turn the life of someone to God. So this outpouring, this Pentecostal anointing, if you will, it's embedded in us having the full understanding of what the outpouring of the presence of God is all about. It's not in our white clothes, no. Because you can wear white today and turn around and be filthy tomorrow. Or it might have been filthy last night, wear white today and take on the same old filth. But God wants to cleanse the heart. He wants to pour himself out inside of us so that we can be a representation of the kingdom of God in the earth. It says he will also go before him in the spirit of, and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the, of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This turning of hearts for the New Testament church took place at the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost wasn't a one-time event, no. But it was the beginning of an outpouring, a fresh outpouring, a fresh oil, a fresh anointing, a fresh wind, fresh fire. The wind, the fire, and the tongue symbolize that a new era was beginning. A new era that will continue until the second coming of Christ. So every day that you wake up is a celebration of the season of the Pentecost. When we embrace that, the Holy Spirit will operate in our lives continually. Let's stand, please. This wind of transformation is arriving at our doorstep even now. The presence of the Lord is here right now. If you will, just raise your hand as we go off the air. I want to thank all of us that have entered into this new assignment because in entering into this new assignment, we will see the outpouring of God in a new way. Your lies cannot, I refuse to allow it to be the same as it was yesterday. I pray and I look forward to the day when we call for five days of service that you're not coming to be revived because you are already revived. We're not having revivals. We're having an opportunity to spend time in corporate worship with God. So I want us as we go forward in this next period in time where God has taken us, be ready. Don't get ready. Father, I thank you for this time of sharing, of caring, of expressing your love through the word of God. Lord, I pray that every person on the sound of my voice will experience you in a manner that they've never done before. For, pour out yourself to them, Lord. If there's one amongst us, I know that your healing virtue, your healing power is here right now. Thank you. Your healing power is here to change, to transform, to rearrange lives. Father, I thank you for our visitors today. For them, it's just, it may just be coming. But God, you sent them here to hear a life-transforming word that they needed to bring about an uplift. 
Father, I thank you, O God, for those that labor in the ministry, work hard in front of and behind the scenes. Lord, I pray for them that their lives, O God, will be perpetually blessed. Now, Father, as we are entering into a new dimension in you, Lord, make us in tune to your will and to your way. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people say amen, amen, amen and amen. Give God a hand, praise, will you?